Tonight, breaking his silence, an exclusive interview with a Canadian accused of being a secret agent. Are you a spy? No. A former Mountie defends himself. I'm a patriot, not a traitor. Over accusations he spied for China. Hey, drop the gun! Spring break chaos in Florida with a gun pulled on a crowded beach. Plus, Donald Trump's legal troubles become a financial strain. His lawyers say he can't secure a nearly half billion dollar bond. The Mulroney family remembers the former prime minister as a father. It's just been incredibly humbling to hear the outpouring of support. Plus, the icing on a perfect season. You never go into a season thinking you're never going to lose a single game. An unbeaten run of 43 wins in a row, and now a national championship. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. A man who is alleged to have betrayed Canada and who made a career out of going undercover is tonight going public with his side of the story. William Eicher is accused of being a foreign agent for China and charged under the Security of Information Act, the law used to prosecute alleged spies in this country. Separated from his wife and two daughters, aged 7 and 11, who remain in Asia, he is now living with his sister in Niagara Falls, required to check in weekly with police as he awaits trial. CTV's Judy Trin sat down with the former Mountie exclusively and starts us off tonight. When he was a Mountie, William Miker infiltrated terror groups and drug cartels by going undercover as a money launderer. He was put on an assassin's hit list with a bounty on his head. Some people then would say that you are a master of deception. I'm a patriot, not a traitor. And I challenge almost anybody who'd be watching this uh, to, to put themselves at the kind of risks I've put for, for my country and for our allies. After retiring from policing in 2007, Miker moved to Hong Kong and became a cyber crime expert. The RCMP thinks he's been turned. They've charged Miker with breaking Canada's secrets law. It could come with a sentence of more than 10 years in prison. Miker is accused of using his knowledge and network to gather information for China to intimidate a Vancouver real estate tycoon. Are you a spy? No. In 2014, China launched an anti-corruption campaign known as Fox Hunt to track down fugitives hiding their money overseas. Canada even signed a treaty in 2016 agreeing to help China recover assets and share in the proceeds. While in Hong Kong, Miker spoke openly about his business, helping China recover more than $1 trillion in stolen money. We typically don't catch smart money launderers. We typically don't catch... Uh, smart criminals. We get lucky or we get informants. But by 2020, the RCMP was warning that China was using Fox Hunt to control its diaspora and silence critics. According to court documents, Miker's alleged offenses of foreign interference occurred between 2014 and 2019. After putting up a $250,000 bond, Miker got bail, but longs to be reunited with his wife and two daughters who remain in Asia. This is what I, I deal with every day when I talk to them. It's an appointment. I certainly don't want to be here. I want to be with my family. Micro's next court date is on April 22nd. At that time, his lawyer is going to make a motion to quash the charges against him based on jurisdictional grounds. Micro's alleged victim lives in Vancouver, but he's being tried in a Quebec court. Omar, investigators say Micro's roots in BC are too deep. Before he retired, he ran the Financial Crimes Division for that province. Judy, incredible insight. William Miker, as we know, was charged last July after an investigation that was launched two years before that. So what is he saying about why he is speaking out now? Well, Miker is frustrated with the slow pace of Canada's court system, and he wanted to go public because he wanted people to know that he came back voluntarily. He found out that he was under investigation and gone on a plane and arrived in Vancouver expecting to set the record straight. Instead, handcuffs were slapped on him.
All right, Judy Trin in Ottawa tonight. Judy, thank you. In the typically boisterous and sometimes fractious lower chamber of the Canadian Parliament, members rose above politics today to come together and pay tribute to this country's 18th Prime Minister. Watching from the gallery, Brian Mulroney's children and wife, who are in the capital for the lying in state ahead of Saturday's state funeral in Montreal. Here's CTV's Mike Lecouture. Resembling the poise of the former Prime Minister, the Mulroney family arrived on Parliament Hill to mourn the politician and the person. Following a moment of silence, parliamentarians of all political stripes paid tribute to the man who led Canada for nearly a decade. While many mentioned his policies, most spoke of the family man. Mila, Caroline, Ben, Mark, Nicholas, you saw it up close. And you know how hard it can be. But on the big things, you also know full well he wouldn't let himself succumb to temporary pressure. He was motivated by service. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev recalled a time when he asked Brian Mulroney for advice. What is it that he did uh, to deal with all the strain of the job, the anticipation of a close election, the worry about the fate of a political battle, that he surmounted worry through one word, Mila. Mila Mulroney. Each of the speeches directed at the Mulroney family who had gathered in the gallery of the House of Commons. The leader of the Green Party with a nod to his leadership on the environment. Brian Mulroney quite literally saved all life on earth when Canada stood up and organized the Montreal Protocol and saved the ozone layer. Words that moved the Mulroney family who addressed the media with their father's trademark humour. For us, sitting up in the gallery and hearing everybody speak so positively, probably not what he was used to, uh, but he would have loved it and we did as well. Memories of Mulroney will continue to be shared throughout the week as the former Prime Minister will lay in state in Ottawa. Mourners will then be able to pay their respects in Montreal before his funeral on Saturday. Omar. All right, Michael Couture in Ottawa tonight, where members of Parliament voted late this evening on an NDP motion calling on the federal government to, quote, officially recognize the state of Palestine. That version of the motion, though, was then amended urging Canada to, quote, actively pursue the establishment of a Palestinian state as part of a negotiated two-state solution aligning with Canada's existing foreign policy. CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver joins us now from Ottawa. Annie. Omar, no G7 nation currently recognizes the Palestinian state. Instead, Canada and others support a two-state solution that creates a Palestinian state as the outcome of peace talks with Israel. But the NDP wanted Canada to recognize it now, and that's why they used their opposition day motion to call for immediate action and policy changes regarding Gaza and the occupied Palestinian territories. The motion took up much of the day for parliamentarians, and shortly before a vote was supposed to happen, the Liberals introduced a number of amendments, including including removing the recognition of the Palestinian state and replacing it with a commitment to work towards its creation through peace talks with Israel, Canada's current foreign policy. The last minute move didn't sit well with the opposition and even some Liberal MPs. That change is not, that is no mere grammatical or semantic change, Mr. Speaker. That is the crux of what is being debated today, a major uh, uh, a point in the debate that has been carried all day today. This was tabled after the entire debate had concluded. How could you have such a substantive amendment that nobody has the chance to see or debate at all? It offends my privileges and the privileges of the people in that royal. The NDP says the amendment represents a positive step forward for Canada, saying that for the first time the government is now agreeing to cease the further authorization and transfer of arms exports to Israel. That is not something that Canada has ever said before, this motion will now be the will of the House and the government's going to vote in favour of ending arms sales to Israel. That is a massive change. Late tonight, the amended motion passed overwhelmingly, 204 to 117, with just three Liberals and the Conservatives voting against it. Now, tonight's vote is non-binding, meaning there's nothing forcing the government to make anything in this motion official government policy. Omar. All right, Annie, thank you. The conflict is also dividing Canadians beyond Parliament. Hate crimes in this country's largest city have skyrocketed. 
As demonstrated by the number of arrests and charges, our hate crime unit will continue to pursue incidents of hate-motivated behavior fairly and firmly. Toronto police said today since the start of the Israel-Hamas war on October 7th, hate crimes have nearly doubled from the same time last year. More than 200 incidents. Most are anti-Semitic. Rampant violence has upended spring break after this terrifying confrontation on a beach in Florida. Hey, drop the gun! Drop the gun, Police say 16-year-old boy pulled out a gun. Officers drew their weapons and chased down the teenager who has been arrested. The family of a Calgary man killed after a tense 30-hour standoff with police is speaking out, wondering why it had to end the way it did. He felt as well as I felt that even if he came out, which we believe he did, they chose to fire at him anyway and end his life. 45-year-old Patrick Kimmel was shot to death by police after he barricaded himself inside a home. Police said Kimmel fired more than 100 rounds during the standoff. There's more gunshots being fired. Kimmel had a history of legal troubles and was arrested after an armed home invasion. His son also says he suffered from addictions and mental health issues. A Canadian-born commander in a volunteer fighting group in Ukraine has died fighting the Russian invasion. The news comes as Vladimir Putin declared a landslide victory in Russia's presidential election, which Canada called a sham. Addressing thousands gathering in Moscow's Red Square, Putin congratulated Russians on the country's illegal annexation of Crimea. A decade ago, Putin has now secured another six years as president, claiming he won 87 percent of the vote. He is now poised to become Russia's longest ruling leader. Donald Trump's lawyers say their client is facing a cash crunch and is unable to finance a bond in New York over his civil fraud trial. But it's what he said at an Ohio rally this weekend that has many warning Trump's rhetoric has become especially alarming in a deeply divided country. Here's CTV's Washington Bureau Chief Joy Melvin. Donald Trump begins his rallies with this. Please rise for the horribly and unfairly treated January 6th hostages. Praising and promising pardons to the hundreds of Trump supporters convicted of crimes in the deadly Capitol attack. His former vice president, whose life was endangered that day, is having none of it. After a lot of prayer and reflection, I've come to the conclusion that I'm, uh, I, I won't be endorsing Donald Trump this year. But it's this remark riffing about foreign car imports that set off a firestorm. We're going to put a 100% tariff on every single car that comes across the line. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole. That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. The Joe Biden re-election campaign seized on Trump's comments, releasing this new political ad. And it's going to be a bloodbath for the country. Highlighting what they call Trump's pattern of inciting violence. Very fine people on both sides. This police officer who survived the Capitol attack says when Trump says it, believe it. That's what he's literally telling us, that he's going to be a dictator for one day. He calling for political violence. What is there to stop him from doing those things? Trump insists he was just talking about cars, turning his defense into a new fundraising appeal. He'll need it. The former president is facing a cash crunch. Trump can't secure a bond for nearly half a billion dollars to appeal his New York fraud case. The court found Trump liable for inflating the value of his real estate assets to get better loans. If he can't get the bond, he can't appeal, and his assets, his properties, could be seized. Trump faces lots of legal challenges, but now that he's the Republican presidential candidate, people are paying closer attention. And this is just a preview of his campaign. Omar? All right, Joy, thanks. The heads of Canada's major telecommunications companies defended what they charge customers in front of a House of Commons committee today. The CEOs of Rogers, Telus & Bell, the parent company of CTV, said phone and Internet prices are dropping, pointing to Statistics Canada data showing that prices have declined 16 percent in the past year. But they say Canadians might not be feeling it because of higher data usage and high spectrum costs. It depends what Canadians are choosing. Some are choosing to pay a lot lower rates. Some are choosing to upgrade uh, to get more value for their plans. 
An accessibility and affordability study was launched after Rogers confirmed it was hiking bills for customers not on contract. Advocates say companies could be doing more. If we're constantly being forced to call them up and negotiate a better deal, that's not easy for us and it doesn't show that they have the respect for us as customers that we should be getting. Some in the housing industry are hopeful tides may be turning as home starts increase and now sales are following suit. New data from the Canadian Real Estate Association shows nearly a 20% jump compared with a year ago. And from homes to cars, coming up. We are addressing that by putting our investigative efforts where they're needed the most. Auto thefts accelerate in Canada's biggest city. Plus, a hockey dream team posts a perfect season. Car thefts across Canada are surging, and today Toronto's police chief said alleged criminals are increasingly using weapons to threaten their victims. There have been 68 carjackings so far this year. That's a 106% increase compared to the same period last year. CTV's Raheem Lavani reports. Every 40 minutes, that is how often a vehicle was stolen in Toronto last year. That adds up to more than 12,000 vehicles, and these crimes are escalating across the city. And we are addressing that by putting our investigative efforts where they're needed the most, which is to address the violent activity that we see happening. New data reveals there have been 68 carjackings so far in 2024. That's a 106% jump compared to the same period last year. There have also been 34 break and enters for auto thefts this year, compared to 22 for all of 2023. A significant number of those that have been arrested are young offenders. It is a multi-pronged approach with other um, levels, uh, and we'll leave it at uh, government, that we all need to get on board and, and address these uh, young individuals that are participating. Over the past six months, a joint task force between the Toronto Police Service and the Ontario Provincial Police have put a dent in carjacking thefts, arresting 121 suspects while recovering 157 stolen vehicles. Now, police are adding automatic license plate recognition readers in their vehicles to scan stolen plates. And that's going to be a very, very... Um significant impact over time, our ability to actually detect stolen cars in our presence uh, when our police cars are driving around the city. And Another tool police hope will help catch organized criminals. Raheem Ladani, CTV News, Toronto. Coming up next, the latest work from the elusive Banksy. An Icelandic volcano that's erupted for the fourth time in as many months is still spewing lava tonight. Molten rock is gushing out of a huge fissure not too far from Iceland's capital. And a popular tourist site, the Blue Lagoon, is now closed. So far, newly built giant barriers are holding and steering the lava away from a nearby town. The most well-known and elusive street artist in the world has resurfaced in London. Banksy's latest work is already drawing a crowd eager to decipher its message. Here's CTV's Genevieve Beauchemin. In a North London neighborhood where there's little green space, a social commentary appeared, courtesy of Banksy. I think it's amazing, honestly. Um, I've always known about Banksy's artwork. I didn't actually know that there was going to be one so close to home. The mural went up on an empty residential building on Hornsey Street Sunday. After hours of speculation, the notoriously private Banksy confirmed on social media this was his latest creation. I like it very much. I think it's very interesting um, because of the way it talks about climate change and how we're trying to uh, make up for the damage. With a half a century old cherry tree and declining health in the foreground, an stenciled depiction of a woman, a Banksy signature, seeming to be filling in the foliage with green paint. Dozens of onlookers have speculated on the message. Maybe that's what uh, the point is, that we need to take control, regreen our environment. 
says the notoriously private artist's first confirmed work of public art since December, when drones were added to a stop sign also in London, though it was taken down by two men accused of theft. Banksy's work first surfaced in the 1990s, but his appeal continues to grow. So we don't actually know who he is, and that's the mystique surrounding him that is in so um, enticing and appealing to us. The wall behind the tree, though, is already peeling, and so questions have surfaced as to the longevity of this latest Banksy. From Toronto, where this one was preserved after the former OPP headquarters on which it was created was torn down, to various sites in Ukraine, local authorities have found ways to try to save the precious works. But it's not clear what could be done on Hornsey Road and whether the cherry tree can be saved too. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. After the break, skating into history, an astonishing new record for a New Brunswick hockey team. A spectacular season was capped off in flawless fashion. The University of New Brunswick hockey team successfully defended their crown as national champions, and they made history doing it. Here's CTV's Sarah Plowman. Champions again. The University of New Brunswick men's hockey team holds not just back-to-back -back national titles, but a new remarkable record. Oh, you never go into a season thinking you're never going to lose a single game. So tonight's it's special that we got it done. Not only did the team post a perfect 43-0 season, but in the championship tournament, they won without giving up a goal. We did something really special this year, and uh, I don't know if it's fully sank in yet, but uh, like I said, I'm just so proud of this group. To come to this tournament and to you know, go through the three wins and three shutouts is historic. Men's university hockey teams have gone undefeated before, but not for 50 years. This was the most games ever won in a single season. Uh, we, we've had nine teams complete a perfect regular season and postseason to get to the University Cup championship, but they were unable to win the national title. Analysts praise the program, especially UNB's head coach. Whatever Gardner touches seems to turn to gold. Coach Gardner McDougal has earned nine national titles. He credits the whole group. Incredibly special. It's almost, uh, you look back the whole season, almost like a, a fairy tale season, and uh, Cinderella kept her shoes on this time. Success guided by consistency and a hunger to improve. You know, we start talking about winning, winning this trophy uh, September 1st when we come together. Our group really, really focused on just staying in the present and, and taking it day by day. The last time this team faced defeat was a year ago. The coach tells me there are high standards at the UNB hockey program, but they've been raised for these players and Canada. Sarah Plowman, CTV News, Fredericton. And that's a snapshot of this Monday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night and see you tomorrow from Ottawa.